Hey, Peter. Hey. When you're playing and you want to connect with people, are you coming from a place of like, or are you coming more from a place of like, I think I'm actually coming more from a place of. <laughs> That's a good place. You know, another good place to come from. What? <laughs> I'm Adam Ennis. And I'm Peter Martin. And you're listening to the You'll Hear It podcast. Jazz discussion. Coming at you. Jazz discussion coming at you today. Sponsored by Open Studio. Go to OpenStudioJazz.com for all your jazz lesson needs and your free trial. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I, Peter, I noticed you fussing with the bell. Well, I just want it ready in case we need it here. I, it was a little bit more, it was a skew towards was, you. It was a little, well, yeah. I, I, it's been the bespoke bell because uh, we... You said it. Yeah, during the live show, we were ringing every time we said that word, the word which shall not be named, which Voldemort. shan't be named. <laughs> shan't be named, yeah. Voldemort. Uh, but you know what? I realized in the last couple of weeks, it's kind of turned into its own thing. So I kind of like the bell is just a little bit of a of an aural punctuation on oh, the podcast. I, yeah, I, absolutely. It's just nice to have a bell around. You know, it's a little menacing with it sitting there, like ready to be. It's it's an arresting level of dbs that come out of that bad boy. You know, I don't know if that comes all the way to the orange microphones. It's meant to be like a front desk bell, obviously for I don't know a hotel, a motel, yeah. perhaps. Have you ever done? I've done that, like especially in Europe, where oh yeah, there'll be like a small hotel. You're getting there, checking in late, and there's nobody at the desk, and you see the bell, and you're like, oh, I don't want to. And in Europe, and a lot of times, to do it softly, and it's like. Wah! Yeah, and then somebody like gets up from underneath and crawls out from under the counter, Some, awakens. Sometimes in Europe too, it's not just like this is a this is it's still ringing. By this the way. is you know, it's, no, it's nice and it's loud and it's crystal clear. But sometimes in Europe they have them and they're like brass. Yes, and they're old and they're ornate. Ornate. Um, uh, one time, Heather, if nice. they're individual bells, they might even be called bespoke bells. Oh, that's good. That, <laughs> now that's good touch. Dynamics. That's dynamics. dynamics right Notice there. the clarity. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So what are we talking about today? Peter, we're talking about motivation today. We're talking about motivation <laughs> for making things. Yes. So uh, for the listeners who don't, who aren't with us at Hilo every, <laughs> every time <laughs> before we record this podcast, Peter yeah. and I spent a ridiculous amount of time chatting about, well, I was going to say chatting about the podcast. We chat about all <laughs> kinds of things we before do. we record. Yeah. And today we're talking about all kinds of things that we might want to talk about and it's uh, sometimes Peter, when we talk about the discussions that we're about to have on the podcast and like the ideas we have, it gets we have like a, a animated, shall we say, discussion mm -hmm. about it. And sometimes we have disagreements. A tete, a tete, they might say. A tete, a tete. And we're, we're making our points, and we're each trying to argue why we think um, what, like what. I, I always find that our discussions. They, I love our discussions, by the way. They they actually help me to define. I think what I want to be talking about here, and just things I want to be thinking about in the realm of music a lot more is by like bouncing them off of you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think a lot of it, when we really, when we talk for a, a long time about it, like we did this morning, like we, it ends up being like motivation. We start talking about, well, what's our motivation for wanting to talk about something like scales versus, you know, the state of jazz journalism in the New York times versus the state of like, uh, you know, young jazz musicians versus the state of other YouTubers. Like we have all of these options that we talk about. We've done many episodes on diff different kind of things, but yeah. uh, the idea of us being sellouts, it's not so much of like <laughs> trying to... There you did it. You touched the third rail. I was wondering how long it was going to take us before we What, talk to say the <laughs> S word? <laughs> S word, exactly. Sellouts. Yeah. yeah. No, but sometimes our motivations, I mean, it's so easy to look at like what's worked in the past yeah. and try to recreate that. And, yeah, this, and, and let me just paint a picture for how that actually manifests itself in our discussions pre-podcast. In, inevitably or invariably, one of us, as we kind of evaluate wh which type of episode we're going to do, 
you know, kind of pulls out of their, their, their trump card out of their back pocket and says, well, let's look at what's worked in the past. Uh, it's always the worst part <laughs> That's of another this, third rail, right? That's a third, is looking back to the past of seeing what's, what's the most popular thing we've done. Right. But, but I think it comes from a place of like what is resonant with our audience. It and certainly is coming from there. There's nothing wrong with that, with looking back and saying like, well, what has resonated? Because you can like, get what do ideas. what people like about us talking about? Right. And this is relevant to making music too, mm-hmm. because sometimes have you ever had a great gig where everything you're playing is popping. Yeah. And then you go and the next night you're on a tour, the next night you go and you want to like, oh, I'm going to recreate exactly. I <laughs> yeah. remember what I did in those solos. I remember how I started. Yeah. I remember, And then you go to do it again and it just you just fall on your face right. when you're looking back at what has worked and you just try to recreate it like verbatim essentially, yes. right? Yeah. And so it's, a, it's, an, it's an easy trap to fall into. I remember... But can um, that be effective, actually? Sometimes it can. Sometimes it could be a good starting off place. But, but I it's think never fun, though, is it's it? It's never fun. Also, like, I always think about the older I get, the more I realize, like, I don't want to recreate what I made that worked. I want to recreate the feeling that I was having as I was making what worked. Mm. Like, so what was it that was happening within me that got me, like, amped about this, that got me curious about something, that got me, like, wanting to make that? Like, I remember the very first... Um, one of the very first things I did uh, with uh, the singer Aaron Bodie that I played with for years and I wrote yeah. songs with her. I wrote her a song that ended up being the title track for her first Max Jazz record. And everybody really loved it. It's called Don't Take Your Time, title track. Hit. It was a little hit. It was a little hit. And uh, I tried to write seven versions of Don't Take Your Time, each one of them worse than the last, right? <laughs> I was young. I was 21 years old, 22 right. years old. I was just trying to like capture some of the success. Oh, everybody liked this one. And then it happened again. The next record, I wrote a song called Holiday for her that was like a legit like on like smooth jazz radio stations yeah. and stuff. And I was like, well, I got to write another holiday because that one really worked. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I must have wrote four holidays <laughs> after right. that. And I'm telling you, man, it's like it's a trap that's easy to get into. And what I should have been doing is like trying to capture whatever I f- was feeling about when I wrote mm. those songs. And then not and then the key to this is then just like let it go. Let go of those results, but just find that feeling, right? So again, it's about process, not yeah. about the product. So is that our first kind of sub definition as a musician or as a composer of selling out is that when we do something that resonates or sells well, however you want to call it, do if chasing after that same level of acceptance or adulation or sales numbers or views or whatever you want to call it, is that selling out or is that serving our audience? I think it's, I think again, it depends on motivation. If your motivation is just to make as much money as you can playing music or making art, I think then you can use it. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, but no, there are people who try to, I think, make as much money as possible in their niche jazz genres, for sure, right. without really considering what what it is they want to make. But can you truly sell out and say, I'm going to be in this niche of jazz? Like, to me, there's certain, there's, like, you're, we're almost putting ourselves in a room that if our main motivation is to make as much money as possible off of music, like, in other words, if you looked at it, like, what are the dollars per composition or per record or per hour that I put into doing this? Like, what's the best ROI, return on investment that I can get for music? Like that, if, if, if that's your sort of guiding North Star, I feel like that's going to keep you away from jazz unless you're going to come up with something totally new. You know what I mean? Like, I, I almost feel like, the, and this is not to be altruistic or anything, but I almost feel like if you're associating yourself, if you're under the umbrella of the, and this is not about like this kind of jazz, no, no, no. We're looking at this as a big tent, right? Yeah. But if you're, if you're, if you're gravitating towards the big tent of jazz, black American music, like there is, there's something about that statement traditionally, at least, and I don't just mean traditionally in the 50s and 60s, I mean up until now, the tradition of jazz, that there's a little bit of a stick it to the man, giving the middle finger to commerce and to selling out by saying, you know what, we're going to put ourselves in this little smaller area mm-hmm. here because we're not sellouts. We're true to the music. We're doing this for the right reasons. Yeah. I'm not saying this is, <laughs> this no, is true or right or wrong. There's 100% like there's a punk sentiment, rock right? streak that runs through a lot of the music right. that we talk about here, and, and there's a political streak to it sometimes too there's certainly like a an ethically artistic streak to a lot of that music however there are also here's the here's i think again it's about motivation billionaires is that what you're going to say there are jazz well billionaires? there are but like 
again, it's about motivation. Kenny G. I don't consider Kenny G a sellout because I've heard Kenny G talk about what he does. He loves the music he makes. To yeah. me, I've been on gigs where it's been like a sold out crowd and it's the band leader's stuff. And I, I'm not going to name names, but they get off stage and they were like, man, I can't believe these people eat that stuff up. It's such <laughs> horse shit. You know what I mean? Like they don't like what they're doing. But they right. do it because people show up for it. Yeah. But to them, it's like, that's not the real stuff. I'm not doing it. Like, I'm doing it because people are showing up for it. That's a sellout to me. Is Their yeah. motivation is like, I'm going... Their heart's against, not in it. I'm going against my heart. Exactly. I'm going against my heart because there's people that are going to buy tickets for this cheesy thing that I don't even like. But I can do that thing that I don't like. Was that in the, under the jazz tent? Yes. Yes, in the bigger tent. Yes. So that doesn't make sense to me because, like, why would you... Like, if you're only interested in the dollars, there's easier ways to make money than to perform jazz live traditionally. <laughs> That's true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> Unless you're just like, this is the only skill that you have and you feel like this is the only way you can make money. Like yeah. it's, it feels like there has to be some love in there, you know? Maybe And maybe there is, but it's, to or me maybe that's... maybe it, it changes over time. Yeah, or maybe it's, it's just... I think a lot of these things too, like, you know, some of these situations, it's just like you just kind of fall into some things, right? Yeah. And like some things happen and you're playing some kind of music that maybe you weren't intending to play or you're, you have some kind of gig you didn't think you'd have. Or yeah. I mean, jazz musicians take gigs all the time from big names. Yeah. And uh, that's another, I've heard, I've seen people come off stage with like big pop acts and be like, Meh. you know. Well, you know, it's interesting. You said you're not going to name names and I'm going to name some names. Do it. But <laughs> do it. Go deep. Better you than me. Um, no, I'm just thinking about like, what are possible times when, I've sold out, and then we're going to talk about you. Well, you just talked about you. Okay. But, um, or when it, there was the perception of it, and was that reality, is it selling out, or is it buying in, as my good friend Rodney Whitaker has called it, when we get into maybe these the, these quandaries or these gray areas. Um, but, you know, I, I toured for a, a short time with Chris Bodie, trumpeter Chris Bodie, yeah. um, years ago. I mean, this might, would have been like, two, the, the, what are they called? The aughts, the 2000s, something like that, late 2000s. The aughts. Yeah. The aughts. Yeah. Um, I ought not have done that. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. That um, word is pretty, um, it's, a, it's a good word. It's a na naughty, aughty. It's got a little it's naughty very specific. sound. It's very specific. You might say it's... Um, oh, oh, boy. Okay, well, okay. there we go. <laughs> um, no, but the, the thing is, okay, so would Chris Bodie, that you mentioned Kenny G., Chris Bodie, would he be sort of a, a little bit more current manifestation of if someone were to say, name me a sellout in jazz and you were going to be a little bit harsh with that mm -hmm. and you had to pick somebody out. I, I would say he might come to mind to a lot of people, especially snobometers, people that are, are far on the snobometer or just people that are really into jazz. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I didn't necessarily worry about it too much because um, – I saw it more as a buying in when I was doing that gig. First of all, the band was really good. Like, but this is always a thing. Like, I always question myself: Am I selling out when I come up with justifications about why I, I'm doing a gig? Well, but it was this. But the band was really good. But the money was really good. Like, if you say the money's really good, isn't that the definition of selling out? Yes, but again, this there's I think there's subtle context in this. So again, I don't think I think Chris Bodie. Like he might, I think, appears to some like that maybe because he's good looking and he's got, you know, glamour shot covers or whatever. Glamour, but like at the mall? I don't get the shots? impression. Yeah. <laughs> he goes to the mall and he takes a glamour shot. I don't get the impression that he is selling, like that he considers, like I think he likes what he's doing. You know what I mean? So if you like what you're doing, you're not selling out? I think if your motivation is this is the music I want to be making because I love this music, okay. but it just so happens to line up that I'm super good looking and people respond to it, then like... Well, I can tell you this, and he's very calculating in terms of what you were referring to earlier, like when you play a solo and then the next night... Remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Like I remember playing yeah, stuff the and the audience would be like, woo, on a certain tune. And Chris would be like, do that again. And I was, I was laughing. I was like, oh, that's, wait, wait. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, that thing you did on When I Fall in Love, you got to play that again t t uh, tomorrow night. Oh yeah. And I thought he was kidding. And then the next night I would just, I mean, I didn't have a lot of, of soul. I mean, whatever. I'd so you're trying to recreate what happened. Well, no, no, I wasn't even thinking about it. And then he came up to me. He was like, no, why didn't you do the thing? Oh, I was no. like, what's the thing? <laughs> you know? And he was, he took that as validation. And I'm not saying this is right or This is not the way I look at improvising a solo. Yeah. But I think that a lot of his effectiveness is about um, identifying things that resonate with his audience, his type of audience. Yeah. 
Um, and then finding that commonality from night to night and not saying like, oh, well, you played in Indianapolis and it was a cool piano solo. That was a one-time only event. There was something in the air that night with that audience. That's cool. Let's not try to recreate. Let's try to recreate that feeling every night because we want to bring that. But who knows? Part of the mystery of jazz is like we don't know when it's going to come and go. We don't know. We're not going to try to bring to Indianapolis yeah. the same thing we're bringing to Cincinnati. Buddy, I think what you're describing here is your feeling of maybe being a sellout for, for those <laughs> Well, I didn't moments. do it. What's interesting, I didn't do it. Like he kind of yeah. pushed, and to his benefit, he was never like, you have to play that. He yeah. tried to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was, my whole thing was I couldn't remember. To yeah. be honest, and I wasn't, I didn't really care about what I played beyond the moment that much to be like, and plus, I already knew at that point that I wasn't going to be able to recreate it in an effective way. Yeah. And to me, maybe I was trying to raise the bar as far as what selling out is. In other words, like it's selling out if you try to recreate a solo. And then it falls on deaf ears. Yeah. You know, kind of like that what you're saying. When, when, yeah. when, when you try to recreate the same hit and it doesn't sell, there's nothing worse than well, that. And there's no way you're going to recreate a solo and it's going to hit the same way. Right. That's just not how it works. Well, I don't know, though. But Chris knew how to do that. Mm -hmm. And he had some other people, really good players in the band that could kind of do that. And yeah. I probably did that more than I'm remembering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because it's not a an on or off type of thing. Like, we, I would definitely push it to the point where, I, I mean, and look, we all do that when we... Oh, my thing went off. That's okay. It was going to be a bad example yeah, anyway. I think when you reach for the bell, you nudge. Oh, the, I'm sorry about the that. Thing here. No, but the idea is like we'll go up for a bluesy sound. Yeah. Like, isn't that a, a, a little bit more of a med, meta level an example of that? Like, we we know it's going to. Aren't we selling out when we play something that we know the audience is going to like? Well, I don't know. <laughs> yes, I guess yes, you are. Yes, because you are. we all do that. It depends on if you like it too, though. Like, it, is it something you would normally do? And also you're like, but oh, well, you're going to like this. Like, I do that all the time. <laughs> but it's stuff that I also very much enjoy. Well, it's like telling your spouse, like, honey, you cook such a beautiful meal. I really want to do the dishes tonight. Like, I don't really want to, but I, but I, but there is a part of it that I do want to do because I don't want her or him to do it, right? So it's like... We do things for other people. We, the music is a service. Don't worry about it, man. I'm not going to... I got nothing. Oh, no. well, since you got it, boom, let me get warmed up here. No, but I mean, when we... <laughs> I mean, I don't really... I don't dislike doing that, but there's times when I pull that out, you know? And not just when you're in an old honky-tonk bar and someone's got a gun to your head. Come on, boy, play something bluesy. Of course, we're going to pull it out. But you love that <laughs> stuff, though. That's your Oscar Peterson stuff. I know, I know. Yeah. But I mean, but it's all like... I, I just don't think it's 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 not in a vacuum. It's not like oh we don't listen to the audience at all. But it's not like play that same thing because Indianapolis loves it. Like where do we find? I think everybody in reality finds that place in the middle. I agree. You know, I remember like Wynton Marsalis playing with him. I'm, I'm not trying to jump a bunch of trumpet players' names. It's just coincidental that I <laughs> name of the episode. Are trumpet players sellouts? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's well that's an interesting thing. Like trumpet oh. players, in my experience, maybe trend a little bit more. Caleb's shaking his head. Yeah, yes, he is. I'm put, I'm throwing him under the bus. This just in, <laughs> Caleb thinks Winton. <laughs> no, I think trumpet players because of that when they're really good. Yeah, you know, maybe trend a little bit more towards um, what we would call selling out this because like the instrument, like what what can be great about it, like what they can't play chords, they can't go down low and all that, but when they go high. They, they yeah. <laughs> they're actually going low in terms of integrity. It is a natural right? <laughs> fireworksy kind of instrument, right? For sure. And look, when we listen to a Freddie Hubbard record, he goes up high. We're not like he's selling out. He's like he's an artistic master, but he knew what he was doing, right? Yeah, absolutely. he's entertaining. There's an entertainment level there, here that's valid. No, also, there's nothing wrong with entertaining people. I mean, this begs the question now: uh, is however you define selling out, if you do it, is it is that is that some kind of moral problem? Are you a sellout if you sell out? Can but you that, sell out without being a but sellout? But is that a negative thing to be a sellout? You know what I mean? Yes. So like you mentioned yes, it taking is. is it? But yeah. maybe but it's I a think, derogatory term, especially for a jazz musician. Yeah. Because even if you get think about this, like great jazz musicians they get called on say like, you know, Beyonce gig or something. They're they're gonna say they're not selling out. Like they've told me this before. I know people who have gone and played on these big pop gigs like that one. Yeah, yeah. And without me even, I'm like, wow, that's so cool. Can you yeah. give me tickets? You know? Yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh yeah. And they they go through this mental gymnastics and verbal gymnastics. It's just so amazing. The production is so first class. We're rehearsing and all this. And a lot of stuff's more complicated than you think. There's like chords. They're you know? like giving caveats <laughs> to everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. so I'm not saying it's good or bad because. You know, I'm not trying to sell out on this issue, but... They could uh, just say, have you seen my pay stubs? <laughs> right. 
but I think isn't this that is more honest. But honestly, like, <laughs> isn't that more honest? Yeah, I think there. It also depends on your circumstance too, man. I mean, like, whatever your. I think everybody is a is a sellout on someone else's scale, right? Right. You know, people would say that just us having open studio and a podcast makes us sellouts because yeah. we're not just making music. Let's let's get into that. Let's anybody teaching. It. Yeah. is a sellout or anybody taking any gig that is not just the music that they want to be taking, but like a sideman gig or whatever. Right. I, I mean, it all changed for me too when I had kids. All of a sudden, a lot <laughs> of gigs that I might not want to do. Right. I mean, if you meet the price that I want to get from this, I might do it no matter what. You but that's know what the I mean? ultimate justification for selling out, right? That's even more so than like, all oh, the music's really complicated. It's like, I got to feed my kids. That's right. And that's like, I mean, who's going to argue with that? There's nothing but nobility with that. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's like, I mean, there's a certain point to that of like, I don't want my kids seeing me like in a, in a, in a, <laughs> in a sailor <laughs> suit, you know, like playing, uh, you know, really corny polka pop. I don't want that. <laughs> polka pop. I just created that, you that did. genre. That yeah, was good. Polka pop. That sounds cool, actually. Uh, well, let's talk about what we actually do here at the pod and with the Open Studio and as teachers and really, I think, as kind of creators and leaders of this community, which that's a, that's a good, that's a good, like, topic. what are we selling? Because we can't say, well, we're not selling, like, we're, we're, we are actively selling something here, right? Much more so than most jazz musicians or any musicians, classical, pop, or, or otherwise. Unless you're like writing the music and like in the front line or something would typically say. So like when once you put yourself out there as we've put ourselves out there, I mean you're all over the internet saying, check out these chords and then buy my course that I'm gonna like I'm I'm selling you something. That's what we're saying. Yeah. But what is it that we are selling actually? Well, it's that's a question we ask ourselves a lot around here. And I think it's valid to question your, again, your motivations for what you're doing. And we can certainly point to people who make similar things to us mm -hmm. that I think in our, in our view, they're like kind of, it's, it's kind of corny and mm -hmm. it's kind of selling out and it's kind of for the wrong reasons, which yeah. is to make a bunch of money. And it's, and, and but why is it selling out there? Is it because it's corny or because it's, we see it as lower quality or is it because they're mo we suspect that their motivation is not we suspect altruistic. that their their motivation is not altruistic. Okay. Not that ours is altruistic either. It's not like we don't want to make though. money, but we have a mission that is is led by you, which is to actually help people play better. And if we can run our business mm -hmm. with that mission, then that's like the perfect combination, right? If we can make a living helping people play better, but actually not. Again, I, I've told this story before, but it, this is, I think, a brilliant move by our CEO, Peter Martin, five years ago, maybe. But, and he, uh, the, the original North Star sort of, what is this called? Your mission statement yeah. for Open Studio was to be the number one online jazz platform in the world or something like that, right? To be the number one jazz education site in the world. And you changed that about five years ago to, something like to help our global community of musicians become better players. Right. And that shift in our mindset of not trying to, to grow, to be the best, to, to be number one, to be the top dog, but to shift to, okay, we, our whole mission is not to be the best and to be number one. It's to be the best at helping people. Mm -hmm. It's like to be the best at actually helping people try to get better, to communicate our struggles with that, to communicate ways that we've grown, uh, that has ironically made us the, no the number one online jazz community with, with that shift. But that to me, even as an artist, I think about that move all the time because I think about it's my motivation as a piano player to be the best piano player ever. Mm. There was a time when I was young where I would thought maybe that's what it should be or to be the most respected, you know, famous burning piano player in the world. And that's not my motivation Thus, now. But that would be leading to you being the dustiest pianist in your 70s, it perhaps. Could be. <laughs> my motivation as a more mature artist is to connect with people through music, mm. right? It's to do, it's to, it's to continue on what's really a spiritual journey for me through music that has been my whole life and to connect people who see that. We see the same thing. We see the same light. We hear the same light mm. through music. That has changed the whole way I make music and it's made me a way better musician. It's fantastic stuff. And I think it, it you know... But I just want to say, that's all inspired by that move that you made five years ago. Well, and, and what I can just tell you that that move was made really more for the reasons of like... We had a, a platform already. And even before that, even before Open Studio, like I was starting to have this platform that was not really 
totally by, by design because I'd spent years like my the platform that I have was playing music yeah. and like people hearing music, my own records and, and primarily playing with other people and playing with some like big jazz artists where I sculpted, you know, with the music direction, all the, you know, similar to you with like, you know, behind the scenes, but kind of out there at different times. And, but being involved with stuff that, you know, by grace and luck and, 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 you know, just being at the right place at the right time and being prepared was generally, I think in the, in the zone of stuff I was excited and passionate about, right. you know. Um, but like once we started to develop, at, you know, really just starting out as this kind of individual teacher and then a little online where all of a sudden it's like, oh shit, you can reach a lot of people. Let me let me get my stuff together and really come up with stuff that's like showing them the exact right fingerings and the right chords, you know. So it was very much from that standpoint of not wanting to be a fraud, basically, and not like wanting, you know, I mean, I remember like putting these things out and people were like, oh my God, your videos are everywhere. And my first thought was like, uh oh, I, I hope it didn't make it into like Jason Moran's feed. That's hilarious, man. <laughs> like That's I was so, so afraid funny. I was going to get a text from Jason Moran, say or or you know Robert Glasper or, or any of these pianists, you know, kind of my contemporaries, but just like that's what it immediately went to. You know, I mean, I wasn't worried about like Herbie. Were you worried you were faking the funk or something? <laughs> yeah. Or or just because it wasn't that I wasn't putting thought into it, but I didn't have a master plan in terms of like, I'm going to put this video. On You're stage. just talking about stuff that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I was definitely trying to be helpful. Yeah. But I didn't really know because we don't talk behind the scenes a lot about how you do this. And that was kind of one of the things that I wanted to get to people because I got to see like Roy Hargrove showing me different things, but we never, like whenever we would hang out or McBride, I was just doing a game with him this weekend. We never talk about music. Yeah. Like away from the band. I mean, we talk about music that we like yeah, yeah, yeah. and cool things. Or maybe you're not talking about chord voicings and no, all that No, and there's yeah. all this stuff that like, you know, I wanted to learn and and talk about. So like with you on this podcast and just us hanging out, I've, I've talked more with you about music than anybody in my life. You know, same, you know, just about yeah. like the ins and outs of the stuff. And then also just through teaching we've done together and individually, you start to go through these different processes. So it was that when it got to the point five years ago, whenever, when I tried to come up with this other thing, that was just more about like, we're getting all this like attention. We have a platform and I could see that it was about to get like super complicated. I was like, well, how can we make sure not that we take over the world, but that we just do the one thing that I think. I have no guarantee, but I think we have a chance of being able to do, which is to help people play jazz better. That's right. Because remember, like at the beginning, and even before we were working together on this, I was just like, you know, well, maybe this will become piano and classical and all that. And you know what? It still may be. But like at a certain point, once you're starting to, to me, the, the, the way to keep from selling out, at least in a way that becomes fraudulent, like I think we alluded to earlier, where it's like, maybe you're doing something good, but it's like you're coming off stage. And maybe people are excited and grooving and they're uplifting. You come off stage, and you're like, ah, oh, those suckers. <laughs> let's go, let's go take this to the bank and, and clocking in kind of a thing. Yeah. To me, the equivalent here of that would be like if we're selling a bunch of stuff, but it's not having an impact. Because we're going into this area where we're not just playing music and you have to lift them up for this time. We have to help people find a way not to love jazz, not to love the piano, not to love each other, whatever, but how to love themselves in a way as yeah. musicians yeah. and meet them where they are and help them to get better. And, and the, that was the simplest way I could figure it out, you know? It's the, it just happens to be the hard road to take too. Like yeah. that's not the easy way is to just serve yourself yeah. and be like, figure it out, you know? Or to just give people, you know, which is where I started out, like check this out. Yeah. Oh, you can't do that? Yeah, that's why I'm great. I mean, I was never thinking about that, but... I do feel like it came across like that. Or or give some cool things, well, like here's a cool voicing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this goes on to the um, what you're talking about here. We, we were talking about this a little bit last week. So there's the idea that you can... It's, it's all about asking the question, who is this serving? Like, am I serving just me here or am I serving something bigger than myself? Yeah. I, either other people or, in this case you know, the idea, and which would be music for us, right? And so, like, we've heard people say things like, oh, I'm not going to serve um, uh, someone else's, you know, vision or something like that. And I was talking to Heather about this last week because I heard someone say that. And I was like, you know what? I was like, all the people I know who have, like, really fulfilled visions, right? Successful, they had a dream, Peter Martin included, and they've like executed really well on that. They are service machines. Like mm -hmm. your existence as this sort of leader of Open Studio is really to serve all of us on the front lines making it happen, right? That's what 
great people do. I mm. think about people like Benny Green, who you think like that's a very solitary kind of musician, right? Benny mm. Green, he of course he plays with everybody or whatever, but he's very much on his own path. Mm. He's got a career as Benny Green the pianist. I don't know anybody who's more devoted to the music, the way he talks about it, the way he studies it, than mm. Benny Green. Mm. He's so devoted to serving music and the piano and the masters and he has his gurus i mean it's like it's like a devotional practice and a spiritual practice like you have a guru and you serve them or you serve christ or you serve whomever like you can name any of the of the people that you might or the 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 things the big you might dogs. serve the big dogs in <laughs> spirituality that you might serve and benny green is i think very much a, a devotee of music and of his of his, his gurus, of his masters yeah. that he, and those are the people that he knows, people he doesn't know that he just serves musically yeah. as a great example. And I just used him He's one of all of the great people we know. McBride is another one. Mm. Chris McBride serves the music and actually serves the greater jazz and music community as a whole better than anybody else I know. You know, he's, yeah. and he's made an incredible, like ironically, when you do that, <laughs> you get a lot of attention for your own stuff because you have put down serving the eye and you are serving the greater vision of everything. And I think it it this is a, what we're talking about with motivation. Like, you know, if you are a sellout, quote unquote, I think you're just serving yourself and everything you're doing is to serve your own personal, uh, your own personal goals and your own personal momentum. And you can have the same outcomes and even sometimes better outcomes by serving something greater than yourself, serving the music, serving your band, serving your audience, mm. really being of service to those people. And then ironically, it looks like you're, you're really like propelling yourself forward because people respond so positively to that, but you're, you're, that's not how you're framing it. In your yeah. own head, you're framing it as I'm serving this thing that is bigger than me. And mm. it's not about me. It's about this bigger mission. Yeah. You know? That's yeah. I think that's that that's, makes sense. That's doesn't absolutely it? it. And it, I mean, and that's kind of like a, a beautiful, nuanced sort of definition within our music, and and can be applied to a lot of different areas of the whole, like art versus commerce versus service. Yeah, you know, and and how, and I think a lot of times people, you know, adding the service element clarifies all this and explains it in in a, and I think a beautiful way. Because if you just uh, it too too often it's re it's this like reductionist thing of art versus commerce, you know you're either an artist and you're an idiot and and your life is you know you're you're gonna die a pauper and your kids are gonna hate you because you didn't spend time with them, or you're an operator uh, that is a genius at marketing and sucks at music and you're gonna have success all over online and everyone's gonna be pissed off and bitter against you, and. I mean, both of those exist, <laughs> yeah. but they're not like when you put in the service part of it, like that's where you can connect this in a way. I mean, you like you bring up McBride, you know, think about like all the different ways, like, well, Benny Green too, too, like you were talking about I, what came to mind was his writings about Art Blakey when he first played with totally. him. Like that's such a service to that, all that he's put that stuff out there. Yeah. Like that doesn't really like, that's not about him. You know, no. yeah, it's from his vantage point. But I mean, think about the young music. And I was around, I saw him play with Art Blake and was like, oh my God, I want to do that. But think about the youngins now, um, or anybody that's just been involved with the music or something, like these stories, of course, always the music that Manny Green is probably going to be the biggest service that he's given his records and For sure. seeing him live, that's always exciting. But hearing him talk, because I mean, it's like him or McBride, like we geek out and like, oh my God, he can play so fast and all that. But the audience is like, that's a part of it, but it's like that warm kind of musical that hug. Light that's organized. coming out. And that doesn't happen if you're just serving yourself. And by the way, none of these people are pushovers either. Being no. the service to someone, to something bigger than yourself, it actually, it makes them very strong, very like uh, boundaried people. Yes. Right? Who are, like I think about Fred Hirsch in, in a very similar way. Like Fred, notoriously direct <laughs> when, especially dealing with yes. students and, and dealing with anybody. And honest. When we, when we recorded his first course and it was like kind of during the, some of the pandemic still. Yeah. And so he was in New Jersey and I was on a zoom in the, in the studio. He came in and I was like, Hey Fred, good morning. Really excited about this. And he goes, the first thing he said was like, uh, I don't need any notes on this. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But you know, that's because he is extremely confident he's serving the music in general and yeah. his teaching that he's spent decades doing. So and he's very clear. I don't think he like 
is trying to be, you know, hurt my feelings. In no. fact, it's his feelings aren't in his mind. My feelings aren't in his mind. Right. Serving the music is the first foremost in his mind. And actually, it's a lesson to all of us of like, put your feelings, you know, your your own like ego aside and how your your spot in the hierarchy of things and just let the music be served in the best way possible. Yeah. Sometimes that means stepping back. Well, and it's just funny how, how people, the stories are told about different musicians and that, it's like, oh, he's so like. It, there's a way to look at that story about Fred and be like, oh, he's so haughty or cocky or prickly. Or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's difficult to work with, and when in fact, like that's he's being humble before the music. Like he's like, I don't need any notes. Not because he, like he's very singular in thinking of like, how am I going to get the best product he so that it, that it can get out there and yeah. serve the most number of people? We've worked with, with him, the least amount of friction possible. We've worked with him on a ton of stuff now, and yeah. he, I can, he is not hard to work with. In fact, he's very easy to work with because he knows exactly what he wants to right, do. Right. And it's really easy to and get And he knows something. he's not there to serve you and your feelings. No, like, no, that's no. The, he knows know. exactly what he wants and yeah. he knows how to get it. And all we have to do is sort of like stay out of the way and right. record it as as purely as we can. Uh, I would say Ron Carter was very similar. Yes. You know, a lot of the moves that he, were, he was making in the studio, he was like, he knew what he had. He knew exactly how to get what, what he wanted yeah. out of that recording process. It was great to see, man, because he's serving his vision for the music and what he thinks is best for teaching the bass in the way that he wants to teach it. I think, again, it all comes down to your motivation. Are you serving yourself? Are you serving something bigger than yourself, i.e. the music, hopefully, or the students yeah. as part of that the community, community, the art. Yeah. Um, okay, so did we answer the question, are we sellouts? Yes. Yes, we answered the question, or yes, we are sellouts. <laughs> we'll leave it. We'll leave it to the so dear let's listeners. Do let's to both. Decide. Let's yeah. both answer honestly. We're going to count to three, okay. and we're going to say well, the royal we, you and I, including okay. Caleb, okay. producer Caleb. Well, Caleb's in this too. He's going to bring Caleb's back. We're going to score this. And yeah, you know, is it better than Kob kind of thing? Or no? <laughs> yeah, we're just going to. It's going to binary. Yes or no? Are we sellouts? Ready after three. So okay. like on four. One, two. Three. No. Oh,